Yo, what's up everybody and welcome back to video number 10 where we are going to look at the concepts and we are going to ask what is Spark? Because at that point in time you may be asking yourself why does it take so long if I execute my Spark application? It takes much longer than it would take for example to use Pandas to do the very same task. For example, reading that small CSV file and printing it out to the console. And yeah, with Spark, it takes a couple of seconds to complete this very simple operations. And also another question arising, which may be arising is why do we need to bind to a port in the first place? We are running on a local machine after all. And in this video, I want to yeah, answer these questions and yeah, discuss with you what Spark is in the end. And the answer is actually quite simple and it's the very core of the existence of Spark because Spark is actually a distributed processing engine. So the code that we are running locally on our machine now, we can run it locally, but we can run the very same code also on huge clusters um, being comprised of dozens or even hundreds of machines in such a cluster and therefore yeah, there's a lot of overhead involved if we run a spark application so they need to happen communication between the machines that's why we need ports and yeah local network communication and a lot of yeah managing processes which are happening on each of these machines so in the end we can process a couple of hundred um, lines in a ZSV file like, like we're doing in our examples or we can run this very same code on gigabytes of data comprised of billions of rows and it doesn't change what we are writing in our user program. So Spark is usually um, used as a processing engine on top of data lakes where data lakes are usually file based um, large scale data stores um, in comparison or opposed to data warehouses who usually combine the storage layer and the processing layer. These two are separate in the most big data platforms these days. So there is a data lake which has no processing powers or capabilities and then we use Spark which adds a SQL-like API to access files in the data lake and therefore we can process data using Spark as a processing tool and also write back the resulting tables into the data lake using Spark. So Spark is not a database, rather it's a processing engine which provides us with many data access functionalities like uh, the data frame loaders as we have this seen them. There is support for most open file formats and also we have the same functionality for many file formats for the saving or for the writing back of the results into a data lake. Now, what I wanted to show you in this video also is that Spark is based on a master-slave architecture. Now, we usually have one driver, which is a single process, which is responsible for scheduling and planning the tasks that we want to run on our cluster. So usually our main application that we develop, we submit it to a driver or on the master node. And this driver actually does the synchronization and the scheduling on the workers, which is the second part of our cluster. So we have one driver and many workers and the driver basically orchestrates and also yeah, synchronizes and schedules workload on the workers. So here's the very high level um, architecture of Spark. You can find this in, on the Spark web website and then under deploying and overview. And here you can see the very high level view about the architecture of Spark. So what we can see is that we have one driver program. That's what we are developing in our IDE here locally and also running locally. Um, and here we instantiate the Spark context, which is basically the Spark core equivalent of the Spark session, which we are using in Spark SQL. But this comes down to being a Spark context in the end, and it's the central entry point for entering the Spark world. On the other hand, we have many worker nodes. This could be any number. 
and they basically start executor processes. So one executor per node and one executor actually can simply execute some tasks and we are going to see what a task exactly is, what it is comprised of in a Spark program. But here we can schedule basically, basically tasks on worker nodes. On, within the worker nodes, we have executors. Yeah, and in between there is a cluster manager, which we haven't talked about yet. But if we are dealing with larger clusters, there's usually a cluster manager in place against which we submit our Spark application. And the cluster manager will basically instantiate the driver program and also the workers and executors on the workers and manages basically the um, resource allocation on the cluster. The scheduling and the planning of the programs or how do we execute our user program that we have written using, this, using the Spark SQL API is done in the driver program. And the driver program then goes ahead and schedules tasks on the executors and also monitors their process, uh, processes, uh, progress, sorry, <laughs> and also synchronizes them um, in case we, we have the necessity for a synchronization. Now to understand what we are doing in our driver program or in our yeah, application, Spark application, we basically, um, yeah, using transformations which are predefined in the Spark SQL API, and these uh, transformations that we are using, they are assembled, assembled in the driver program into an abstract uh, representation of what the program is supposed to do. And this is called the DAG, the Directed Acyclic Graph. But um, the details of this and optimization that, uh, optimizations that also happen in a Spark program we are going to talk in a second video about concepts. Here, I wanted to show you the more high level architecture of Spark. Now here in this video, I only wanted to clarify why it takes yeah, much longer than for example, running a Python script or pandas using, on, uh, using our small ZSV file. And now we understand better why. And if we use pandas, for example, we would uh, have to take care of all the parallelization if we wanted to have it all by ourselves. But this would be probably the solution to go for if we just wanted to process a small ZSV file like we have here. However, I just started this tutorial like this because, you know, in, in the professional context, that's exactly how we are going to develop high quality Spark code. And basically by running our program locally, and writing tests, developing high quality units that we are going to compose into a very complex program, but we are going to run our applications, even if they are supposed to run on very, very large data and very uh, large clusters, we're going to develop them like we do here on our local machines. That's the key takeaway. Thanks for tuning in and see you in video number 11.